get started. It's now exactly 9.30. Please settle down. So as I mentioned, this is day two. We had a wonderful day yesterday with Professor Ranjay Gulati of the Harvard Business School talking about why purpose is critical. And today we'll have uh, Mr. Chandrasekharan, chairman of the board of Tata Sons, and he'll be talking about the Tata journey. And I'm really looking forward to it. But before we get going, let me make a few announcements. First, in terms of safety, both here in Kemka as well as in Godridge, we have three exits, up in front, in the middle, and at the back. So in case of an emergency, please make sure to take these exits. There are plenty of them, and please do so in an orderly manner. Needless to say, please mute your microphones. Please settle down, and uh, we'll have a half an hour talk by Mr. Chandrasekharan, followed by a Q&A. So the questions can be asked after the half an hour talk. And here's the way in which you can ask the questions. If you're online, there is a ask questions button and you can use that button to ask questions. If you're in Kemka or in Godridge, please raise your hand and someone will get to you and you can ask uh, questions in person. So those were the announcements I wanted to make. Once again, welcome, welcome to this fascinating and I hope wonderful series called CEO Dialogues Leading with Purpose. And now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Harish Manwani. Harish is the chairperson of the governing board of Iowa State. Silently. He's been a fantastic chairperson of the governing board. He's also the senior operating partner of the Blackstone Group. And uh, he's a director of several organizations, including the Tata Sons. And also very importantly, he was formerly the chief operating officer of Unilever, the global consumer goods giant. So uh, Harish would introduce Mr. Chandrasekharan and then ask a few questions of Mr. Chandrasekharan. So without much ado, let me introduce Harish, request him to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Can you hear me? Well, good morning. It's great to see uh, that we have a full house and I can see that there are some other people who haven't bought tickets for this show, who are, uh, who are sort of jostling at the gates. But uh, thank you for, for all of you, to all of you for being here. And I'm really happy and delighted that uh, we had a great opening yesterday with uh, Professor Ranja Gulati. And all I can say is that the best is yet to come. And I have really pleasure in introducing uh, Chandra, uh, a friend, a colleague, and above all, the custodian of the, of the largest and the most trusted corporate brand in India, and arguably probably in the whole world. And I say this with due consideration. Chandra is also a Padma Bhushan, and according to me, and enviably, a six-star finisher of the World Marathon Majors. Chandra joined the Tata Group in TCS 30 years ago, straight from university, and rose to be one of its most successful CEOs uh, in, its, in its very successful history. In 2017, he took over as the chairman of Tata Sons, the holding company of the Tata Group the largest conglomerate in India, associated with a diverse set of businesses from salt to software, as they say. The group has 29 publicly listed companies and a combined market cap of over $300 billion in 2022, operates out of 100 countries and employs nearly a million people. Most importantly, the history of the Tata Group has been closely intertwined with the history of nation building in India for the last 150 years. And here is the interesting fact. Two thirds of the group's ownership is held by philanthropic trusts, which support education, health, livelihood generation, art and culture, and everything Indian. This is a corporate, a string of pearls held together by a common vision a common purpose and shared values. Over to Chandra, the extraordinary marathon man at the helm of affairs of this very extraordinary group. So to you, Chandra, 
Over to you now. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. It's such a pleasure to have this opportunity. First of all, let me thank Harish for those graceful comments and also giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this morning. I also would like to thank Dean Madan Pilutla, who has been very helpful in organizing this lecture because we went from uh, I being there to online and then being there again to back to addressing all of you online. See, uh, the topic that I've been asked to speak is about the Tata journey of leading with purpose. And in order to understand what this journey has been and what leading with purpose means, you've got to go back more than 150 years. You've got to understand the thoughts that went through and shaped our founder, Jamsadji Tata. It all began way back in the 1860s when Jamsadji Tata started the Tata group with the first few businesses. At that time, he spelled out the philosophy of the group. I quote, in a free enterprise, the community is not just another stakeholder in the business, but in fact, the very existence of it. This is how he started and he pursued this philosophy in each of his ventures. And let me tell you, he had many ventures. He started the Empress Mills, one of the most famous companies of that time in 1874. He ran Empress Mills to be a very, very profitable company. In fact, it was one of the most profitable enterprises of its time, driven by focusing on excellent product quality, latest technology of those times, such as the ring spindles. It generated a lot of profits. The shareholders benefited immensely. But Jamsadji used a fair share of those profits for employees and the community. Look at it. He introduced the pension fund for employees in 1887. He introduced an accident compensation scheme for workers in 1895. A provident fund scheme in 1901. And most importantly, in 1919, when the child care for women, working women, was virtually unheard of, not only in India and in the world, he set up two crushes so that the babies of women employed in the Empress Mill can be engaged while they were working. And in 1921, he made a very generous grant and established a girls school in Nagpur. Each one of these community initiatives or employee welfare schemes that he announced and set up were way ahead of its time. In fact, in 1895, he spoke in the annual meeting of the Empress Mills. I repeat, unquote, we do not claim to be more unselfish or more generous or more philanthropic than other people. But we think we started our business on sound principles and straightforward business principles and we considered the interests of our shareholders as our own and the health 
and welfare of our employees the sure foundation of our prosperity so these were the words spoke by james sir g in 1895 and in his own mind as he evolved what he referred to as community slowly expanded to mean the nation thereafter all his initiatives became initiatives for the love of india in 1882 he went to london and then he was attending a lecture by a gentleman called thomas carlyle a very influential philosopher an english author one of the remarks made by thomas carlyle stayed in jamshed ji's mind the remark was the nation which gains control of iron will soon control gold then he realized on traveling back india needs iron and steel to build bridges to build buildings to build roads then he was very serious about setting up a iron and steel company he did not get much support from the british so he traveled all the way to the united states to new york and pittsburgh to find the best technology and he approached the finest engineers of the for that of that time charles paj perrin and requested him to come back to india and help him set up the tata steel company that's how tata steel was born and there are many such stories i'll say a few then he set up a foundation called jn tata endowment trust in 1892 because he believed giving an opportunity to the brightest minds to study in the best institutions in the world is what was required to help india develop and it's not only about helping the poor people at the bottom of the pyramid and over the years it has supported more than 5000 scholars among them are the eminent people like the president of india k r narayanan dr raja ramana and many others then in the 1890s he realized that india needed a science and technology institution so he wanted to set up indian institute of science in bangalore three years after he started this initiative as a matter of coincidence he had the opportunity to travel in a ship with swami vivekananda who also enforced the same theme and later on 9 years later in 1899 vivekananda joined jamshed ji tata in championing the institute and requested many people to help raise the money later on in his will jamshed ji tata left one third of his wealth to the university because he had two sons the institute became to be known as his third son then in 1903 he wanted a lot of overseas people to come to india to the city of bombay to develop economic activity that's how he set up the most iconic hotel in bombay the taj mahal hotel then in the 1890s bombay was full of textile mills and all coal based and he saw the whole city getting polluted then he thought about setting up a clean power and that's how in 1897 he started tata power company with the first hydro electric power project way ahead of its time we talk about renewable energy and sustainable energy today this was started by him in 1897 so there are many things that jamshed ji did which got very deeply engraved in the ethos of the tata group and in the very dna of the tata group the people who followed him notably jrd tata and 
Ratan Tata pretty much embraced this philosophy and all their actions and new ventures were very much on the same principles. Jari Tata was the chairman of the group for 50 years from 1938 to 1991. During this period, he pioneered many, many institutions. In fact, by the time he took over, already two trusts, Sir Jorabji Tata Trust and Sir Ratan Tata Trust, owned more than 50% of the holding company Tata Sons. So Jayadi Tata wrote in the foreword on the biography book of Jamsetji Tata, the wealth gathered by Jamsetji Tata Sons in half a century of industrial pioneering formed but a minute fraction of the amount by which they enriched the nation. But the whole of the wealth is held in trust for the people and used exclusively for their benefit. The cycle is thus complete. What came from people has gone back to the people multiple times over. And that had a deep impression on him. And he started venturing into businesses which he felt were needed for India. That's how Air India was born because he felt any developing nation should have an airline of its own. Then he set up a Tata sports club, which he chaired for over 40 years. And the Tatas, till date, have contributed 50 Olympians to the country. Then he wanted to set up, again, advanced institutions. Responding to the call of a young scientist, Dr. Homi Baba, he helped set up the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He also developed what is called as Bombay Plan, a very famous blueprint, which was developed in 1944 for the development of Bombay and Maharashtra. And it was Jayadi Tata who approached Prime Minister Nehru soon after independence to set up a national fund because many people had suffered during the partition and they all needed rehabilitation. And that's how the Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's Relief Fund was originally set up by Jawaharlal Nehru. Then JRD felt the need for commercial vehicles in India because for movements of goods. Then he started Telco. He believed in the vision of Mr. Kohli and supported him to set up TCS in 1968. And he worked with Darbari said because at that time, India needed nutritional salt. Basically, the salt lacked iodine. So iodized salt was set up as a company. And that's how Tata Chemicals was born. And there are many things that I can talk about Jadi Tata's time. But then I leave it and then talk about the next phase where Mr. Ratan Tata continued the legacy. He felt India needed to develop things indigenously. So he set up the Tata Motors passenger car company and then developed the first homegrown indigenous car in Tata Indica. And then he felt India was primarily looking at developing businesses here, but in order to be a country the business country of global importance, India needed companies which had global businesses. So he encouraged the Tata Group companies as well as the industry at large to create cross-border acquisitions and build global companies. That's how the Tata Global Beverage Company bought Tetley in the UK, Tata Chemicals company bought multiple businesses in UK, United States, and in Africa. Tata Steel bought Chorus, and Tata Motors bought the most iconic Jaguar Land Rover company. The Indian hotels company started to expand into different parts of the globe. 
Then in healthcare, he was very disturbed about the proliferation of cancer and wanted to address it in a significant way. So the Tata Trust, under his leadership, got into creating chain of cancer hospitals in every part of the country. Initially, a big hospital was set up in Calcutta. Since then, seven more hospitals have been launched and 20 more in the pipeline. And even during COVID, it was he who immediately felt the need for the businesses to play an important role and first came out and committed 1,500 crores towards COVID relief. So there are many examples of how the group has always put the purpose first in building businesses. It is not to say that you build businesses without profit. In fact, the motto of the group has been to create wealth. But how do you use that wealth? And how do you run your business with the highest ethical principles? And how do you remain fair to your shareholders, but at the same time, you pay attention to the health and welfare of employees and look after their families and what impact you make in the communities in which you develop your business. If I just reflect back and connect the dots over the last 150 years, which I've tried to do many times as part of my learning, I find that there are seven basic themes which have evolved the group over these 150 years. The first one, the ownership of the group, which Harish pointed out in his opening remarks, by the philanthropic trusts, which do activities that are dedicated to the nation. That forms the foundation and the bedrock. Second, how do we pioneer and venture into industries which fall at the intersection of business opportunity and nation building? Get into those businesses which are important for building the nation, but at the same time are viable businesses so that it becomes a proposition that generates wealth. The third, how do you think long term and set up institutions of national importance, whether it is Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore, or the National Center of Performing Arts in Mumbai, or whether it is the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, or any number of other institutions that taught us have set up and we continue to set up even today. Fourth, support the nation in terms of setting up major programs that address social needs and emergencies, whether it is the COVID relief, whether it is the Tata Group, sustain, Tata Sustainability Group, and addressing disaster reliefs whenever they occur, or things like the Indian Institute of Skills, which, is, which we are setting up just now, which is a long-term focus institution, but at the same time addresses the social need of today, or affirmative actions, which is a very important group initiative and a group committee that focuses on taking actions to help people to achieve a level of life, level of skills, which they have been deprived of. And the fifth, support sports, whether it is supporting the Olympians, cricketers, hockey academy, Kabaddi academy, archery academy, 
how do you support sports as a team or the tata himalayan trekking club mountaineering club and the sixth how do you give whether it is through endowments sponsorships or funding how do you nurture talent talent for the future for building the nation and finally contribute to ideas whether it is the bombay plan or the thought leadership notes that we develop to the central government or the state governments to address what is needed to be addressed by sharing ideas and bringing the intellectual rigor that is needed all these themes play a very important role have played an important role over the years in the way the group has ventured and has developed its businesses even today the initiatives that we have launched whether it is building a 5g or a 6g a mobile network gear company as an alternative player for the global markets is very much a national and a global need tata's getting into air india is also driven by the purpose because india needs air india and getting into an electronics value chain from manufacturing to assembly packaging testing to fab design is a dire need for the future of india at the same time it's a very sound business opportunity because it has got a huge global need and potential and our commitment to electric vehicles renewable power carbon capture and achieving a net zero target goal of 2045 is very much to lead this movement so that we can create a better tomorrow those are the initial comments i want to make but i want to stress that in this 150 years as i reflect that doing a profitable viable business which is clearly purpose driven and can contribute to society as well as can keep the national priorities in mind has been the ethos and it is very much possible and in fact can be very successful and that has been my learning reflecting back and studying the past of the group thank you and over to you harish you want to take it from here well thank you very much chandra even though i have heard this story every time i listen to it uh, i i just feel so inspired by the fact that uh, uh, that that in india we have a group like tatas and importantly the fact that i can be associated with it in any small way uh, just a couple of questions before we open it up to the public the first is uh, you know i i just want you to spell out what is the essence of being a tata company and importantly i referred to tatas as a string of pearls you got a huge number of 
uh, companies, 29 publicly listed companies and so many unlisted companies. What is it that holds this? Or what's the glue that holds this, the, these companies together? And how do you ensure a shared purpose? Great question, Harish. The DNA of what I spoke about is very deeply ingrained. Taught us evoke trust not only within the group but in the whole nation. Everyone expects a Tata company to behave in the most responsible manner, trusted manner, with highest values of integrity and that is deeply felt by everyone in the group not necessarily only at the top but that is deeply ingrained deep inside the group so that responsibility glues all of us together and at the group center, as you very much know, Harish, we have a few core governance mechanisms, like the Tata Code of Conduct, Tata Ethics Code, Tata Business Excellence Model. Tata's commitment to affirmative actions. Tata's sustainability goals. These are central functions at Tata Sons. All of these are tied together with our brand equity and brand promotion document. We call it Tata BBP. Every company is a signatory to the Tata brand equity document by which they sign up to live by the values of all these things I talked about. And every employee is committed to the Tata ethics code. This is not just a signature process. This is deeply ingrained, as he said. And the new people are taken through the programs, through the Tata Volunteering Week, Tata Ethics Conclave, Tata Sustainability Conclave, the Business Excellence Symposium. So there are many, many interventions so that we share our knowledge, we make sure that we remain vibrant, why the values are static, the practices have to be vibrant because the world moves on. So what does the value system mean in the cyber world? What does it mean in the digital world? What does it mean to use AI for good? So how do you become responsible? How do you adopt innovation? So there are mechanisms that have been set up over the years which we continue to enrich as we go along. And that's how the group is bound together. Thank you, Chandra. And I think for this audience, uh, the thing to remember is that you have to quali qualify to be a Tata company, irrespective of whether it's a majority shareholding or a minority shareholding. You cannot use the brand Tata's by just paying a royalty you have to adhere to this common essence or common values. So thank you, Chandra, for that. And my final question before we open it up to this very enthusiastic audience is you've now been at the helm of affairs at Tata Sons for, uh, uh, since 2017. What do you think must remain the same? And importantly, what do you think needs to change going forward? 
I have said it uh, always. Uh, the history brings a lot of responsibility for us because the Tata Group has been run with the highest standards of ethics and has been unyielding in its value system, has been very swift whenever things go wrong, like the Tata finance episode, at which time Mr. Ratan Tata clearly moved in and made it good for all the investors and depositors. So the values, the integrity, and all the principles, like the code of conduct, have to remain the same not only have to remain the same, have to be the foundation on which we build anything and everything we do. If you can do any business, however profitable it may be, if it has to compromise in any one of those things, it's not for us. But history also creates complexity. With complexity, comes, if I may say so, a lack of agility. So what we have been at it is the group has to be agile, has to reinvent itself for the new businesses while we are very committed to the businesses like the steel and the power and the auto. We need to make the transition in these businesses to be for the 21st century and beyond, like the electric vehicles, like the hydrogen buses, like the renewable energy, like the small modular nuclear reactors for the future of sustainable energy. We have to make those investments. And we also have to create businesses for tomorrow's consumer. whether it is the Tata New, whether it is the electronics and semiconductors, whether it is 5G or any future businesses that are relevant for the next 50 years and beyond, we have got to build those portfolios. So the portfolio has to continue to evolve. And we want to be agile. We want to be performance centric. And we want the Tata brand to be as attractive to the younger people, to the millennials, to the Gen Z, to all those people in the two auditoriums today, as much as we are attractive and relevant to others. Thank you, Chandra. Uh, I can see who you're referring to as others. And, uh, and with that, uh, over to you, Ram, to uh, bring in the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Arish. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chandrasekharan. And uh, hearing your presentation, it seems clear to me that in many ways, the Tata journey and the word Tata itself is a synonym for purpose. It goes without saying it's a cinnamon, synonym. And that uh, this, uh, the story is woven into the fabric of India itself. I'm sure many of us have connections to the Tatas, perhaps studied in these institutions. I myself am a child of TIFR and a student of the Tata Institute or IASC in the Institute of Science. And with that, uh, we have three audiences here. We have this live audience here in Temka. We have a live audience in Godrej, which is in Mohali. And we also have an online audience. So the process I'll follow is I'll ask a question first of uh, Kemka. Please raise your hand and keep your question crisp. Then I'll turn to Godridge. And again, please keep a question crisp. And then I'll be looking at the online questions that have come up here. We have 20 minutes, which is enough time for some interesting questions. Let me start with, I saw a hand up there. Please go ahead. Hi. And you know, quickly introduce yourself. Hi. Yes. Hi, hi, sir. Uh, so thank you so much for this session. My name is Shaurya. 
Uh, I have a question. So as an ardent follower of a lot of leaders from across the world, including Mr. Jayadi Tata and Ratan Tata, there's a question that I've had for a lot of years that I perhaps want to ask today. So my question is that we talked a lot extensively about the stories of the Tata and what all Mr. JRD Tata and the Tatas have been able to achieve. However, it cannot be a one person job, right? So my question is that what are the ethos, not the brand ethos, but the organizational ethos of the Tatas that help the company, uh, you know, hold it together and constantly expanding across generations. So that's my question. Mr. Chansegun, was the question clear? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shari. Uh, very valid question. I think the most important thing in the Tata group is whether it is Jamshedji, whether it is JRD, whether it is Ratan Tata. They all empowered people and built leaders. And Tata group has many successful leaders. If you see the CEOs who have run many of the companies and in the 19, early, early 1900s, 1950s and later, and they've all been Tata lifers, they have been empowered they very passionately believe in the same ethos. And that's how the whole system is held together. And take my own example. Where can you think of starting your career as a graduate trainee? Base purely on opportunities and the empowerment that such a large conglomerate presence that defines everything cannot be said in words. Some are words like empowerment, principles, governance. And some, the system, how the system works, how the system presents opportunities. And that's all I can tell you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chansai. Thank you. Let me, let me turn to the Godridge Auditorium and uh, Mohali. And if, is there a question there? Please keep your question crisp. Let's uh, hear a question from uh, Mohali. And while that's getting set up, let me take another question here from Kenka. Go ahead. And again, please make sure to keep your question crisp and introduce yourself. And then I'll turn to the online audience after I talk to Mark Godridge. Can we have a microphone there, Hello. please? Hello. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, go ahead. that's okay. And because you have an ISP t-shirt, I guess you get to ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, my question is very specific to TAS, which is Tata Administrative Services, to a very integral part of Tata Group and uh, essentially in the leadership position. Uh, how uh, Mr. Chandra sees TAS going uh, beyond from here, is essentially after COVID, and when can we see a lot of new colleges joining the TAS, because until now we do not have TAS at ISB. So that question okay. is very precise. And how can we include diversity in TAS? Okay. Yeah. So I guess the question is, uh, Mr. Chansai, how do you see TAS going forward? The Tata Administrative see, TAS is a very important leadership talent development tool, which has served the group Lady. for decades. And it will remain so. With the size and scale of the group growing and expanding, we will always need 
a lot of talent and a lot of diverse talent. So I don't know why ISB is not part of the task program. I will take it up today. <laughs> and uh, we would like to have, we would like to have talent coming from everywhere, definitely from a school like ISB. Tata's also, we have launched what is called as a global internship program. We announced it before the pandemic and we did it through virtual means and then this year it has gone physical where we get about 500 interns globally. We try to keep the mix very wide and diverse. We want all nationalities. We go to schools which are very prominent, very well known like the MITs. Lady in the middle. And the Stanfords and the the popular ones in India also, but also we go to tier three, tier four institutions. We go to Latin America, we go to China, we go everywhere. The idea is to get students from diverse background as long as they have the hunger and they have the they qualify certain criteria. So we are experimenting and trying to get people from diverse backgrounds and after completing their interns, we hope and wish that all of them join the group. We give exposure to all kinds of programs. It's not only business programs. Some people work in consulting, some people work in steel, some people work in social programs. And we, we, we create projects, 100 plus projects, where each project takes three, four, five people. And these projects are done on the ground. So talent development and talent for the 21st century is going to be very, very, very important initiative. By talent, I mean skills, I mean leadership, I mean um, creative talent. So it's just not uh, traditional engineers or business school talent. We need them, but we need more. Thank you, Mr. Chansekhan. And we'll send you the name of that person who asked the question on test. <laughs> but there's a lady in the middle who had a yeah. question. Um, there's a question right in the middle. Go ahead with the COVID mask, which is wonderful. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you for the session, sir. So I'm Vismay. So my question is as follows. So how do you motivate people, especially of this generation, to focus on, you know, both nation building as well as the growth of your firm? Because there's this increased focus on, you know, growth hacking and profit making strategy. So how do you mo motivate people to look at the larger picture? Yeah. I think... Uh... It's never a um, problem because when you take a large pool of people, it's always distributed. It is not that um, even in, in this sample of people who are attending the lecture today, I'm pretty sure there'll be a set of people who will be focused on purpose-based initiatives there'll be sort of people who will be focused on how do I become a millionaire next year? <laughs> right? So I think these aspirations, both aspirations are not wrong. Both aspirations are correct. But the only way the purpose has to be brought to life is sharing and giving exposure. And that is why it is very important that people have exposure to various things that are going on, not only business projects, but also social projects. And many of you, I, I don't know your curriculum, many of you, I'm pretty sure, also do engagements in the field. Some of you may take break here, which has become common nowadays. When we grew up, I think, you know, we were, we were going for the first job that we can get. And nowadays, I think people talk, uh, take break here, which is not a bad thing. I think, uh, 
it's very important to explore all the things that are going on and fully understand uh, the disparity, the inequality that exists, the healthcare problems that exist, what the nation needs in order to be a truly, um, in the full sense of the world, a world, a developed nation where the inequality is at least balanced. It's not, it's not very huge. So it's only by giving exposure, giving lectures. I think ISB is doing quite a bit of that in this leadership series. And any form of exposure, field trips, lecture series, case studies, uh, internships, um, and then uh, try to try to reach out and talk to more more people who have been through this. No, yeah, no, no easy, I, easy solutions. Yeah, sorry, I just like to add to Chandra's answer. You know, this has to be an and and approach. In other words, you can do whatever you think you need to do. But make sure you do it right and you do a good business. It doesn't matter. As long as you do good business or you do the right things, to my mind, that is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chansekhan and Harish. Now, let's move over to the Godridge Auditorium, Mohali, where we have a large group there. Can, we, can I have one or two questions from there, please? Again, please make sure to keep your question crisp. Hi, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, I have a three-part question, but they're all related. Uh, by the way, my name is Shubham. forgot to introduce myself. Uh, Please go ahead. One culture and uh, values. Uh, if you could speak yeah. louder, we can't hear you here. Yeah, we can't hear you. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Good morning, Please sir. Go my name is Shubham. I have a three-part question, but they're all related. Number one, uh, culture and values tend to get diluted with scale. So how does an organization preserve these as you scale and across time? Number two, walking this path is not Thank so you, straightforward. Sorry. So what one question start? only, please. If you could just ask one question, articulate it clearly. That would be much appreciated. Sure. Go ahead. Just one question, please. I think his question is, question? Uh, how, do you, how do you not dilute culture and values when you scale? That's exactly Absolutely. right. I think, as I said, you've got to be unyielding and then say, what defines us is this code and purpose. And that should be well communicated, well understood across the layers of decision making. And once you do that, you need to be prepared to let go opportunities which doesn't fit the framework. And when you do that once, twice, thrice, 10 times, 15 times, 40 times, it gets embedded. It is about repeatedly doing things in a consistent way. And then taking action whenever Any compromise is done. These are the two means by which you enforce it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And is there another question from the Mohali audience? Hi, uh, I'm Parul. Uh, I work in the staff. Uh, a very good morning from the Mohali campus of ISB. My question is, I'll go back to what Harish asked right in the beginning. And you spoke about, you know, the code of conduct. Uh, the ethics code at Tata, the commitment to affirmative action. And of course, you said specifically that it's not a signature process we follow. Uh, it's ingrained deeply. Now, today, when we build organizations, how do you... And then you also said that, uh, you know, we also are very agile. So how do you maintain that and also be very agile? And how, how do you decide that it's, it's, not, a, it's not a reactive approach we, and of course, it's proactive for Tata's and that's the reason you've sustained and grown so well. So can you just elaborate and give some more examples and make us understand how does Tata do it so well? Thank you. I mean, signature is necessary. Okay, it is not that 
um, you don't you don't uh, you don't get people to commit. You get people to commit, um, but at the same time, that's not enough. It needs communication. It needs workshops. Some people may think, why do you spend a week called Ethics Week? The reason is your stories. You do a volunteering week. Why do you do a volunteering week? Because you engage with people, get people to engage with the communities. See, lifelong, the practical engagement is critical. You can't do anything just by sending out an email. If you send out, send out a large email today, if you send an email which has more lines than the one page of the phone, nobody reads it. In fact, if it is more than two lines uh, in a WhatsApp message, people don't have time for it. So your communication has to be very effective. Storytelling has to be effective. Showcasing has to be very effective. We do a Tata Innovista innovation forum. We get all companies. We get external people to come and judge. We do it at a regional level, company level. Then we do it at the corporate level. It goes on for months. The reason you do that is only that way people will learn and people will internalize it. Otherwise, you can think, why are we wasting time? But unless or otherwise you enable people to internalize a concept, internalize a value, it doesn't happen. So we do it over years, again and again. So any program of this kind takes years. You can't, you can't get up in the morning, stand in front of the mirror and then say, I'm going to be a good man. Then you become a good man. It doesn't happen like that. Right? It is by following and living, Harish was telling you that as long as you do it in the good way, over and over again, and you see other people doing it, and it's getting rewarded, appreciated. And the opposite of it, when things are not done properly. And that's how we build a culture. Culture defines the most important success factor for any company. Culture, there is a saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I'm pretty sure that you're all business school students, you, 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 know, you, know the, um, you know the phrase, but building culture takes time. Culture about values, culture about agility, culture about performance, culture about behavior. And building culture requires tolerance, requires allowed, allowing people to fail, requires no retribution. And that's why it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. So I fundamentally do not believe that you start a business and within one year you value it at 10 billion. It doesn't happen. Those are short-lived. You don't build cultures. You don't build consistent successes. Thank you. Thank you, Mustin. There's a question from the online audience. Uh, many questions of which uh, this is an interesting one. This is a Kanto Ghosh asking a question. There used to be a time when the Tatars used to set up industry towns like Jamshedpur and Mithapur, which uh, generated livelihoods for the community. In this new age industry, is there scope for such activities or uh, is this in a different form in terms of community building? For example, the question goes on to ask, could a big sprawling TCS township be possible on Bengaluru or Hyderabad? Any thoughts on that? So you just, you just helped me 10,000 acres. Help me 10,000 acres. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um... You know, we are building in the electronics manufacturing facility in Hozor. We are trying to create a sort of a township because that place doesn't have housing, that doesn't have no school, no hospital. 
So we are looking at creating all those facilities. But in order to build a proper township, you need land. When you go to the government and ask for a land, they say, why do you need 100 acres? Why can't you do it in 40 acres? Why can't you do it in 60 acres? But you need space. And in many parts of India, we still need. Some are, I mean, may not be relevant for a company like TCS, where the workforce is quiet, but certainly relevant for uh, companies where we create electronics manufacturing, companies where we may create semiconductors. So some areas it may be relevant, some areas it may not be relevant, but it's all about getting support. Thank you. Thank you. And then one final question, which I guess is an inevitable question. This is about AI. And actually, there are many questions on this, but I'll just summarize it. With AI chat GPT being the talk of the town, how is the Tata Group seeing this technology in light of purpose? Any thoughts on how purpose and AI can be combined, including you know, responsible AI and so on? It is, it is my firm view that the world will go through three or four major transitions for the next decade, two decades, three decades. AI is one of them. In fact, one of the most important ones, as much as there will be energy transition, there will be supply chain transition. Uh, we can talk about all that at length. But AI transition is a very important uh, transition that all of us have to face. In personal lives, professional lives, B2B companies, B2C companies, governments, social sector, because the potential is immense. But in order to be successful, we also have to define some framework. There has to be a regulatory framework, which is to be defined across nations. And there has to be security defined, privacy laws defined, what does the AI for good mean? And there are hot debates, and there are a lot of position papers coming in as we speak. Um, some countries are scared, and they're already taking a holiday from AI, the banning chat GPT for a finite period of time. In some places, um, there is a call even by businesses to say that let's not progress this for six months. But I think this thing will go on. It will develop. It has got potential. We just have to catch up and define how we are going to operate. I believe that it is not AI or humans. It is AI and humans. So how do we create appreciation of AI with people and how do we enable people who are less skilled and no skill to use AI in a responsible way and that's the work to be done and once you do that we can truly harness the power of what technology has to offer but there is a lot of work to be done so that we put a framework, we put um, the rules of engagement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chandrasekharan, for that fascinating talk and for addressing the questions, some of which were unusual, I think. Thank you very much. Then, Harish, any concluding words? Oh, uh, well, uh, Chandra, thank you very much, as always, uh, for a very insightful and very open and frank conversation. Really appreciate it. Uh, I know that uh, you were traveling or you're just back. Uh, and, and thank you for making that time in your busy schedule. Thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Harish. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just for the audience, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll have a session with uh, Harish, Mr. Harish Manwani on leadership and purpose. But uh, we'll just do a quick five-minute stretch bio break. And then uh, the audience is invited to stay on, the online audience. Then uh, should we just continue? Okay. Should say, we'll just continue. Oh, okay. okay. Can we have uh, your attention? Why, do, you, do you folks want a five-minute break? 
Okay. Take, okay. But take just a five, five minutes. Break. Just five minutes. Please make sure it's five minutes. Yeah. A stretch break. Let's call it a stretch break. Stretch break. break. Yes. Don't disappear. <laughs> there is an announcement. Your attendance will be recorded post the session also. So please make sure you come back. Your it went well. It went well. Huh? I think it was very good. I love some of the questions. Yes. Your yes. attendance will be counted uh, only if these, your uh, attendance you is registered no, while you leaving to, also. You know the audience and so on. No, I think uh, this is just this a break. Is, you know, things that are unusual, things that are interesting. Right. That's <laughs> This is just a break, right? This is just a break, right? Just a five minutes break. Yeah. Guys, it's just a five minutes break. Please be back on time. Don't leave beach me. <laughs> yeah. You need to get registered your attendance while leaving. Your attendance will not be counted if it's not registered post the session. Hum kuch nahi kar sakte. Please aa jao bas.
And I hope everyone settled at Godridge. We also have overflow theaters, people there, and an online audience. So let's get going. The final session of today. Let me turn it over to Mr. Harish Manwani. Harish, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Seven. Well, good morning again. I I hope that uh, the previous session of Chandra's was uh, insightful for all of you and uh, good learning. I must say, I really mean it, even though I sit on the board of Tata Sons, every time I listen to the Tata story, I'm absolutely convinced that leading with purpose can also be good business. And, uh, and I hope that's the message that you got from that session. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, a more a broad-based discussion on leadership and really based on my own learnings of having sort of worked in the industry for a period of, uh, well, 100 years, I guess. Uh, so these are lessons in leadership and some, most of them are my own and you are free to sort of agree or disagree. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and before I get started on that, I think it's important to understand the context of the world that we live in. And uh, I'm really reminded of uh, a 1917 saying by Lenin during the Russian Revolution, where he says there are decades when nothing happens. And then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think in many ways, that's the world we live in, which is there are weeks every week when decades are happening. In other words, it's not about change that's, that's different in the world. It's the rate of change. And I want to just give you two examples. You know, all of you have heard of Moore's Law? Yeah? Yes or no? Yeah, Moore's Law. So talked about, you know, the fact that computing power will go up uh, every, every two years, double every two years, exponentially. And, you know, just when we thought that... Uh, it was kind of reaching the end of how many transistors you could fit on a microchip. Uh, what do you have now? Quantum computing. So in other words, there is no end to the kind of change that you will see. Give you another example. The Human Genome Project was one project that was started as a collaborative project across the world to sequence the human genome. And uh, it started in 1990. It was a 14-year project. And it had the best scientists in the world. In the first seven years, they could only do 1% of genome sequencing. 1%. And they almost declared the project to be dead. In the next six years, they finished the project. So 99% of the project got done in the next six, one year ahead of schedule. And finally, a great example of change Six months ago, most of you here, I think I would say all of you here, hadn't even heard of chat GPT. You had heard of artificial in intelligence, machine learning, but I doubt whether you had heard of chat GPT. And suddenly, it looks like the flavor of the month. So that's the world that we are living in, a world where the rate of change is, is not just exponential, but unpredictable. So we live in what's called a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and very ambiguous. And in this world, you got to remember, if you have to survive, you have to constantly reinvent yourself. Take an example of an S&P 500 company. What is the average life of an S&P 500 company? Any of you? 21 years, correct. My God, give him some marks. This is a credit course. So 21 years is the average life of an S&P 500 company. Guess what it was 50 years ago? It, it, yeah, it, it was 80 years. So companies survived for 70, 80 years. So that's the world we live in. Now that's one context, which is change. The other bit is there are two or three mega trends that you have to find in, in all this noise. The first mega trend is that we do live in a very resource stressed world. We live in a world where we are consuming almost the equivalent of 1.3, 1.5 planets. And I think I don't need to tell you intelligent folks that we have only one planet. Okay. And if the developing world starts consuming like the developed world, we will need three planets. 
So we have to accept the fact that business models going forward have to be about doing more with less. The second is inequity in the world. A handful of people own most of the wealth in the world. Now, you may say, what the hell is wrong with that? We are studying how to make money. Of course. But the fact is, you have to be aware of the world that you live in. A world where there is inequity of this kind will always be a stressed world. And that leads me to my third point. There is a huge mistrust of business in the world. Every single Edelman survey will tell you that people do not trust businesses. And that is a challenge for, the, for, for businesses. How do you really get the world to, to, to trust you? And finally, the big change is the evolution of technology, which is changing on the one hand, the way we work, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we lead our lives. And at the same time, it's a double-edged weapon because it's also changing the nature of work and it's also going to create disruption. One study says that 30% of people could be unemployed if you just follow the technology trends. Now, we've always heard this before, there is, there is hope, but this is the context of the world. Rapid change, inequity, mistrust, which is tribalism in the world, and importantly, the double-edged sword of technology. Now, in that context, what is the world? What are some of the lessons in leadership? And like I said, these are entirely my own. You can agree or disagree. Even in a world that is so stressed and unpredictable, my first lesson to you is no growth, no future. If businesses can't grow, if countries can't grow, if people can't grow, there is no future. But there are dimensions to growth. You need to make sure that you can grow the business. If you're in a, in a traditional business, you need to grow the business consistently. You need to grow the business profitably. And you need to grow, grow the business competitively. I call these the three Gs of growth. All three are critical. And at the heart of growth lies innovation. But you know, innovation is a much maligned word. People always talk about innovation when they can't think of any other solution. They say, we must innovate. But Clayton Christensen from Harvard gave a very good definition of innovation. He says, innovation is doing things differently that create value. Anything that you do differently that creates value is innovation. So it is not about just those few poets in an organization that are, you know, putting their feet up and, 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 you know, sort of just gazing out into the horizon, thinking of new ideas. It's also people who work day to day, thinking of processes and how to do them differently, because that is innovation. And I always say, if you don't, if, if you want to grow, you have to have a mantra called business as usual on growth but always business unusual on costs. If you don't generate the fuel or the firepower to grow and invest, you can't grow. So therefore, it's a virtuous cycle of innovation, which is thinking of new ideas, disruptive ideas, but at the same time, innovation to get productivity efficiencies in the business. So to my mind, Great companies are companies that are always focused on growth, irrespective of the environment. And they always find a way to redefine the market so they can grow. I call it the Rubik's Cube approach. When I was with Unilever, I used to go to countries, I'll give you one example, went to Mexico, where we have a 60% market share in deodorants. And they said, I said, you know, we got to grow the deodorant business. They said, well, how can we grow? I mean, we have a 60% market share. I said, really? I said, if you look at it by geography, what is our market share in the east of Mexico? They said, east of Mexico, our market share is 40%. I said, well, that's not 60%. Number two, I said, what market share between male and female? They said, our male market share is 65%. Our female market share is 45%. I said, well, that's another growth area. 
The third area was in terms of product form. They said, I said, what's your market share in, in roll-ons? They said, our roll-ons, our market share is uh, some uh, 65%. I said, what's your market share in sticks? They said, it's 35%. I said, that's a growth area. In other words, the point I'm making is you can always define the market to grow the business. It's really important. So those are some of the learn learnings here, which is always go for growth. But there is a virtuous cycle of growth, which comes from also making sure you're focused on costs and innovating for growth, innovating for ideas and innovating for costs. Both are equally important. And now I come to a very important bit, something that all of you have heard in your couple of talks that you've heard, Ranja Gulati and Chandra, which is you have to remain relevant to all stakeholders. Business is not about only satisfying shareholders. And this is really important. Your biggest stakeholder in your business is the communities you serve. It's your biggest stakeholder. And therefore, the model, the new mantra or the model of growth is what I call the four Gs of growth, not three Gs. Growth that is consistent, growth that is competitive, growth that is profitable, but growth that is responsible. Responsible growth is a very important part of how you should manage your business. And you heard a lot about purpose. At the end of the day, the communities that you serve are the ones that actually are the reason why you exist. In fact, it was the, the founder of uh, Ford, Henry Ford, the first Henry Ford, who said, business is not a bonanza. Business is a service. And you heard uh, Chandra talk about what uh, J.R.D. Tata said about business and communities. So stay relevant to all stakeholders. And that brings me to that 4G. 4G is very critical. Now I'll, I'll, I'll talk about something which I strongly believe in, but I know it's very um, controversial. I think in this world, medium term is dead. What matters is the long term and what matters is the here and now. What do I mean by that? In a world that is so choppy and so volatile, you must always have a sense of your destination. Where is it you're trying to go? What is the purpose of your organization? It is so important to know that, particularly when things are changing so dynamically around you. So the, so the long term remains very, very critical. It's like navigating a ship. If you don't know where you're going, you may, not, you may land up going somewhere else, isn't it? So just be absolutely conscious that the long-term destination is very critical. At the same time, what matters is managing the here and now dynamically in a VUCA world because things are changing constantly. And therefore, the long term is relevant. The short term is relevant. Medium term, to my mind, is as good as the exercise that you do on paper. Okay? And the only advice I would have for all of you who are going to do three-year plans and so on, remember, do it on a rolling basis. Do it, do it dynamically because things change, assumptions change. So that would be my third lesson in leadership. My fourth lesson is strategy is execution. Execution is strategy. Every, everyone understands the importance of the picture, the big picture, the strategy. Very few people understand the importance of pixels. There are no pixels, no, no pictures. Simple. And great organizations understand that both picture and pixels are important. The, and what is, what's a great definition of this conversion from strategy and execution? The great definition is, it is the ability of an organization to convert a plan into a PNL. So that is the differential equation here. How do you convert a plan into a PNL? And great organizations are able to do that extremely well. 
It's like an hourglass. Okay. A strategy by definition is a divergent exercise. It's a, by the way, uh, if you don't know how to do strategy, don't worry. A consultant will do it for you. Execution, I'm sorry, no one can do for you. You have to do it. Okay? Strategy is a very simple thing. People make a big meal out of it. What is strategy? What is strategy? Strategy is making choices. Simple. If you have 100 things to do, how do you do three things? How do you select those three things that you have to do? That's strategy. <clears throat> Execution is the art of ensuring that you can take a plan and convert it into a PL. And unfortunately, in every organization, there is that there is that hourglass effect where things get choked in the middle of the organization. A, because either people don't understand what choices you made, or two, they are confused about how exactly to go about executing the strategy. So remember that strategy is execution. Execution is strategy. Don't worry. The lessons will stop at some stage. I haven't learned that much in the number of years that I've spent. Okay. And then I come to fifth lesson, which is everyone talks about continuous improvement. I'm sure all of you have studied it. You've heard it. Great organizations move from continuous improvement and continuous transformation. There is no such thing as moments of transformation or, you know, now we've come to a, to, a, to, a, to a point in the organization where we need to now look at transformation and turnaround. No, don't wait for a crisis. It's important that all, every time, every year, you are ensuring there is continuous improvement to grow your core business. And at the same time, there is continuous transformation to create the future that you need to build on. You heard Chandra yesterday, uh, today talk about uh, uh, creating new businesses. He referred to digital, electronic manufacturing, semiconductors. It's really important. And I call it bending the curve. First, take care of your base momentum. If your core doesn't grow, you have no license to do anything else. But at the same time, constantly address where the puck is going and what is it that you need to do to bend that curve of a natural momentum of your core business. In other words, you need to build your core and at the same time, ensure that you are creating the growth engines of the future. And I call this really one of the most important lessons that I have learned. And there are plenty of examples, you know, from Xerox to Kodak, where they focused on the base momentum, but didn't create, they didn't bend the curve. So that would be my next lesson. And then I come to lesson number six, which I, I think is perhaps one of the most important lessons. How do you create in an organization a horizontal culture. This is a phrase that is very often used by the current uh, founder and CEO of Blackstone, where I work. He says, Blackstone must always have a horizontal culture. What does that mean? Horizontal culture means an, organize, a culture, an organization structure that is based on outcomes. It is not, not based on hierarchy. Vertical organizations are based on hierarchy. I spent a lot of my working life uh, working for Unilever. Great company, but verticalized. And therefore, what happens in vertical organizations? You constantly have a matrix which you have to navigate. And by definition, a matrix is, goes co counterintuitive to agility. Agility is the new currency. Getting things 80% right and doing it quickly is more important than just getting you know, all 100% right. And for that, you need a culture that is outcome-oriented and moves with agility. Now, easier said than done, but I know many organizations that are able to do this, they are organized around outcomes. And I call it, uh, again, there is an article, hopefully, uh, that you will read, which uh, I'm proposing to write with somebody 
about what I call creating tables. Great organizations are able to create tables of decision makers and shuffle these tables quickly enough to be able to change them depending on the outcome that you want. In other words, you need talent, external and internal, to be deployed on solving problems and doing it with speed. In every big organization, there is an interface of matrix. There are a large number of people who hide in these interfaces. Okay? And, and they are called coordinators. They coordinate between one part of the organization and another part of the organization. Okay? Uh, how many of you have traveled to, to London? Okay. You know, when you travel on the, uh, uh, on the tube in London, every time you approach a station, they say, mind the gap. Mind the gap. In organizations, most people, most people who don't have anything to do, hide in the gaps. <laughs> they are hiding between those who do real work and those who coordinate. You know, when I was growing up in Hindustan Lever and I was uh, at, at my early stages of my career, branch manager in Calcutta branch, and we had a real stalwart, AC Chakravarti, we used to all call him AC Da who ran one of our biggest factories in Garden Ridge factory. And he called me once we were having a drink and he says, Harish, you are going to do reasonably well in this organization. I want to give you one lesson. And he says, there are only two types of people who matter. One who makes soap and the other who sells soap. Everyone else is an indirect, is an overhead. You know, I use that lesson right through my career, right through my career in a kind of evolved way, whenever I went to a country, and I, you know, I, one of my last roles was to be the global CEO of Unilever. Whenever I went to a country, Brazil or whatever, I'd ask them what percentage of your resources are upfront selling and what percentage of your, uh, uh, your, your, your uh, people are actually making and supporting this business. And you'll be shocked in large organizations 50, 60% of the people are doing these two activities. 40% are minding the gap. Okay? So horizontal culture, that's the lesson in leadership. Every company is a technology company. I don't need to tell you guys this. You are either a user of technology, a maker of technology, or an enabler of technology. Anyone who thinks that you are going to be impacted by technology, you are living in cuckoo land. Okay? Everyone, every business will get dis disrupted, every business will get disaggregated, and every business can do a better job by embracing technology. So ask yourself, wherever you work, am I embracing technology? Whether you are using technology, enabling technology, or actually, actually, uh, 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 creating technology. It doesn't matter. But every company now is a technology company. Caring is a competitive advantage. What do I mean by this? There are two aspects to caring. One is developing people. That's the best way to care for them. You have to make sure that you upskill your people so that they can, they can operate in a VUCA world. And that is really, really important. Upskilling your people, giving them a license to operate in today's context. I'll give you an example. If you are a 737 pilot, okay, can you fly a Dreamliner? Well, if you have any doubts, the answer is no. Okay, you cannot. You need to be trained to fly a Dreamliner, even though both are Boeing aircrafts. Okay. Similarly, I'll give you another example. I grew up in Hindustan Lever as a marketeer. And at that time, I knew how to, you know, discover what consumer needs were and put, you know, a lot of television advertising, distribute my product as widely as I could, and voila, success. Sorry. What people watch, where people buy, is fundamentally changing. 
and as a consequence i am no i no i no longer have a license to operate as a marketeer i don't so for me to go about as a 737 pilot pretending to be a dreamliner pilot unless i'm trained for it that's the first aspect of caring which is developing people and upskilling people the second aspect is and i'm now quoting one of my uh, erstwhile competitors and they had a fantastic piece of advertising even if i say so myself it said you don't get a second chance to make the first impression okay so when there is a crisis in a business that is the time to raise your game and care for the people covid was a perfect example there were companies who responded brilliantly okay by ensuring that they looked after their employees they retained them and ensured that they created a safe environment for them you did that in 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 the school and i know how many discussions we had on the board what does it mean to to not have people on campus what does it mean to provide isolation or uh, or uh, medical facilities those are the companies that have come out stronger out of covid so caring is a competitive advantage both in terms of developing your employees in terms of employability and upskilling and the second is ensuring you look after them and finally and trust me this is the last leadership matters you matter and often i have been asked what is the role of a leader okay everyone talks leadership you know that's another one of those like strategy and all that you know leadership i have a very simple definition of leaders leaders have followers okay you don't have followers you're not a leader you're just taking a walk in the park just look back sometimes behind you and if there's no one behind you i trust me you're not a leader you're just a pace setter you know what i'm saying and therefore to be a good leader you have to have followership and you have therefore two roles as a leader role number 1 you have to give energy when you walk into a room as a leader do you leave people energized so that they can do more than they ever thought they could do or do you leave a room where people say oh my god this guy sucks energy how many i mean i know a lot of you have work experience there are a lot of bosses who suck energy and there are a lot of bosses who give energy the job of a great leader is to give energy and the second job of a leader and there are only two according to me is the custodian of the reputation of the organization and that brings me to a really important point you become the custodian of an organization when you do the following when you create a purpose driven organization an organization that gives energy makes people wake up people don't wake up because you sell products and services i worked for a company that sold soap and soup that's not exactly a reason for waking up every morning okay but the way we sold soap and soup the way we impacted the lives of people through hygiene health nutrition made a difference to my life and that's the reason i work for unilever and hindustan lever all my life so it's a purpose that gives energy and it is the values that protects the reputation of the organization so new leaders the new age leaders are all about purpose driven and values led that's the new mantra of leadership and that is where i would like to end by saying my final thing jim collins great guy wrote lots of books i'm sure all of you have heard about him jim collins talks about good to great how do companies go from good to great i'm sorry i disagree with him and i'm going to paraphrase it i would much rather we have is that go from great to good companies that produce great financial performance but also good for the societies and communities that we serve so thank you very much for that Thank you Arish thank you very much uh, we have another 20 minutes for Q&A it's about uh, 11 11
And uh, I'm going to follow the following process. Questions from the audience here in Kemka. And uh, now I think a little careful about minding the gap. I think I'll take audio questions only from Mohali. And we'll also, we also have people online. So we'll uh, take some questions there. We have hundreds of people online, hundreds in Mohali. We have uh, hundreds here. So let me start with a question from the audience here. Anyone? Well, please raise your hand and uh, any questions on leadership that matters? Go ahead. And uh, if we can get a microphone over to her, if we can get the microphone. And please give your name and uh, your question. I think you can talk in it. Or if you can speak loudly. Is, is not working? No, no, no. Is, is it working? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it should. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Why don't you give uh, another mic? There we go. Let's try that mic. Oh. Good morning. Morning. I'm Swati. And I'm coming to business school after six and a half years in literature, having taught high school. And uh, the very first time I started with the pre-reads and I heard this growth concept. And I thought to myself, how does that sit with sustainability? And uh, how can growth and such, an, uh, such a manic growth and um, the complete focus on just improving, increasing, progressing, how does that sit with sustainability? I would really like an answer to that. Thank you. Sure. So if you recall, I spoke, to, I spoke about four dimensions of growth. And the last and very important dimension is responsible growth. So the part of that whole responsibility is that you cannot grow indiscriminately at the cost of your climate and at the cost of your, of your environment. And therefore, you have to be responsible in the way you grow the business. But the solution does not lie in stopping growth. Just to give you an example, what does the developed world want from the developing world like China and India? They want you to not consume anymore because, oh my God, you've got a very polluted environment because they are already at a certain stage. Our job is not to stop people's livelihoods or their ability to improve the standard of their living. That's a wrong thing. Our job is to make sure that we can make them do that, but in a responsible way. Less is more. And that is why this whole idea of net zero, the idea of going green, when Unilever decided to adopt, and I don't want to steal Alan's thunder tomorrow when he comes on, and we said, we're going to double our business and at the same time, reduce our environmental impact by half. Okay, it's a commitment, which is a double engine commitment. Sorry for using a term like that. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a twin commitment that you have to make. You can't make one commitment or the other. So therefore, it is about responsible growth. But you cannot forego growth and say, now the best way to not create any problem for the environment is I'm going to close down my business. Not a solution. Okay, right. Thank you, Arish. Uh, yeah, another uh, question. Good, yeah. please. Go ahead. If you could, I, I, it, I, you either you keep it close to your yeah, close, yeah, yeah. Uh, This question might seem a little bit different from all the others that have been asked, but I genuinely do believe that when you reach the scale and the leadership level that you have, you require a lot of investment in yourself over the years. Um, also, it blows my mind that you're 70 years old. You do not look like it. Could you please talk about? Uh, could you please talk about the efforts that you took to inculcate any um, healthy investments in yourself, whether it's yes, your sir. health or your mental ability, etc. That's a great question. Okay, so firstly, uh, I'm only celebrating the 40th anniversary of my 30th birthday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> but on a serious note, you know, this idea of aging, I don't want to get into, but you can go on to TED Talks and so on, and you'll find this. Aging is relative. You, we all talk about, you know, uh, a physiological age. But the most important thing for a human being is to remain active. I'll give you one example. 
when I was finishing with my career in Unilever, I had a choice of either going to the Bahamas or equivalent or Goa and reading newspapers, okay, or, or on iPad, read Times of India and so on, or to do other stuff. And I said, I must do other stuff because I want to constantly keep myself stimulated. The second, and this is probably more important, I said, I must do things where I can input rather than only output. Because I have seen many in my position who go for, they are parts of several boards and they go there and have biscuits and tea and talk about how they did it in their company. I don't want to be part of that. The boards I selected were boards where I had a lot of learning to do. One of the first boards I joined was Qualcomm, which is a maker of semiconductor chips. Okay. Now, to be quite frank, I understand soap and soup. But chips, no, not really. Okay. There was a glossary prepared for me of 400 terms so I could understand the conversation. Now, you may, under, you may ask why did they want me on the board? Because I bring something to the party. I know how to run a global business. But I don't know anything about that technology. I'm on the board of Gilead Sciences, which is a biotech company, leading company in virology and in, uh, in specialist oncology treatments like CAR-T therapy and cell therapy. Now, why am I, what am I telling you? I teach uh, at, at business schools, including I'm associated with ISP because there is a learning here. As long as you're learning, you won't age. Okay. Sure. So that's the first thing. And your second question, which was your first one, I forgot. And that happens <laughs> because I'm really old. <laughs> What was it? Sorry, what was your first? What, what, what measures did you take in terms of personal investment? Oh, personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, actually not enough. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. I do keep myself very active. Uh, but I do think it is. Imp and, and by the way, I am a little more controlled in uh, what I consume. Uh, and I'm not talking about alcohol. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I, I am really sort of, but maybe I should do a lot more exercise because they always say that the best antidote for longevity and good health is exercise. I do some, okay, but I go into, you know, sort of fits and starts. So I would say I would give myself a C there okay. on that front. Right. And uh, while we are preparing a question from Godrej, let me request the SEAL team and Godrej to have a question ready. And meanwhile, Harish, let me ask you a question. Yeah, sure. Who's your role model as a leader? Could you describe uh, what that leader looks, does, smells, feels, talks like? You know, uh, role models and uh, of leadership do change. There are stages in your life where you have uh, different role models. And I've had, I would say I would have, I would have, I've had many mentors in my working life. People I would not have, without whose support and mentorship, I wouldn't have done what I did in wherever I went in my company. But my personal role model, I would say, uh, this may be either trite or uh, some, uh, I have two role models. One is my father who passed away at 96. And he's my role model because at 96, he was the most independent man I've ever known. Okay. His password, by the way, when he passed, I only realized then was wonderful. Mm. Okay. He was hopelessly optimistic. And that's where, what I like about him and the, and the kind of life he led, the hardships and so on, but made everything out of it. And he was in fact, one of the pe people who was, he's a very bright student. He had to give up his studies, uh, uh, his engineering studies. He was the first sort of scholar, a scholarship holder in engineering in the village that he lived pre-partition. And uh, then came partition and he had to leave because he was the elder of the, of the family. And he gave up his studies for three years and then joined uh, college to finish his engineering in India, what is now India. That time it was undivided India. And I love the way when he told my daughters, I have two girls, and he told one of, one of my daughters who loves books, she's got lots of books. 
She said, you know, I love the number of books you've got. You know, I finished my entire engineering graduation without owning a single book. Everything happened in the library. Okay. And then number two, he was a gold medalist. And he had a choice between taking a gold medal, which he had no choice, so he took it. And then taking some embossed books with the university emblem on it, Bombay University. And or taking cash. He says, no choice, I took cash. Okay. So I like the fact that he remained optimistic right through his life and fiercely independent. My second role model is my wife. Okay. So these may sound like, okay, my wife, why? Because she had, she's a wonderful person and she had a couple of episodes of health episodes, which were serious. And the way she managed it, I don't think I would have been able to do so because I'm a, I'm a, what they call a, a good time man. I can manage good times, but to think of somebody who can manage a personal crisis and manage the family, I thought was fantastic. So if you ask me my two permanents, one, my father and my wife, and then there are many mentors I've had throughout my career. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And if, if I can take an audio question from, go ahead, a question from the Godridge Auditorium and uh, Mohave. Let's have a question from there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Rohan out here. Uh, okay. So I had your seventh point in mind that every company is a technology company. So keeping that in mind, uh, you know, we're living in an era of uh, digital revolution and AI optimization. And we spoke uh, that earlier as well. So as a leader, as a leader, how do you handle your employee welfare, keeping, you know, job thoughts in mind and the transition that's happening to, you know, machines from man. So as a leader, how do you tackle that? And what's your strategy? And just one question, please. Let's yeah. just have one question. So, so what was the well, one question then? How do you manage the transition with AI, the ah, AI and technology? Technology Being leader. You know, uh, the from an uh, welfare perspective. Sorry, no, we heard your from question. An employee you. welfare perspective. Yeah. Thanks. How do you manage employee welfare, keeping in mind the transition to AI and yeah. technology? Well, there is only one way to manage employee welfare: is to skill them. And it's the tomorrow. We often don't do this in time. We keep it too late and too little. Okay. So great companies have a point of view. Something I didn't mention in my, in my leadership lessons, all the great people I worked with in companies, I find had a point of view about business, about where the future was right or wrong. They had a point of view. And the only way that you can prepare employees is if you have a point of view of where the world is going. Today, there is a whole chatter on AI, uh, on, on chat GPT. Okay. No pun intended. Question is how many people know what to do? So yeah. Okay. So chat GPT, by the way, I was one of the beta users of chat GPT. Right. And I loved it. I asked them to write a poem for a friend of mine who loves uh, cigars and, and smoke and drinking. And they wrote a brilliant poem, but so what? So the question is, have a point of view. Number two, if you are interested in employee welfare, employee welfare is not about giving people free lunch. Employee welfare is making them more employable. That's the important. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, here's an online question from Ekanto Ghosh. Interesting question. How can a pace setter, a top performer, inspire colleagues to follow them instead of them feeling threatened. Yeah. And how can the pace setter continue the high performance while leading the pack? Right. Very good question. And I spoke about that. I think, you know, there is a stage in your career, early stages of your career, where having the answers is important. And then comes a stage in your life where asking the questions and giving people solutions when they want it is important. You don't empower people by giving them solutions all the time. Firstly, you may not be right. Okay. Number two, that's not the way to run organizations. So my only, my only thing is for if you, a pace setter has to give up some old habits very quickly. All of us and all of you here, 
you're smart folks. You'll work in companies where sometimes the people you work with, you say, my God, this guy is really, or this person's really slow. Okay. No, they're not slow. They just happen to be thinking a little differently, have patience. And in, and when you get into leadership positions, always refrain from giving solutions, ask the questions. And if someone walks into your room or your table or your desk for a, for an answer, don't let them go without helping them get their answer. That's important. But don't always give people, oh, yeah, okay, I'll tell you. What you're going to do tomorrow is this, 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 this. And by the way, we've got competition. This is the way we're going to tackle it. You know what? You make people lazy. You don't want people to think. So let a thousand flowers bloom under you. That's what I would suggest. Thank you, Harish. And then one, thank you. And one final question, actually it's a common pattern in many of the online questions, also asked commonly in classrooms. Uh, many of the concepts we talk about, like horizontal culture and collaboration, they are clearly something we've lived and uh, learned, but many organizations are hierarchical. Often we have a boss who's very hierarchical, very difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. So how do we, what we learn in business schools about horizontal cultures and such collaborative kinds of organizations, how can we put it into practice when the whole environment is not conducive to it? Yeah, yeah. So, I, uh, you know, bosses are a necessary evil. All of us have lived with bosses. By def but on a serious note, just because you have a boss doesn't mean it's bad. Okay? At the end of the day, <clears throat> they bring some experience and so on and so forth. My point is, if you believe that you don't enjoy the work that you do or the people you work with or the boss you work with. Don't work there. Okay. I'm sorry. I have to give you a binary answer. I've given it. All right. On the other hand, all of us, you will become bosses one day. What is that phrase? Saas bhi kabhi bahuti. Okay. You will become bosses. Just remember, bosses are more often than not well-intentioned. Okay, because they're more experienced. They like to see, see if they can be in a hurry. Just have patience and make sure that when you interact with your boss, your boss also gets something out of it. You know what I'm saying? See if you can also make your boss a little bit better. Try it. It may work. Thank you. Your boss is also even. And that brings us to the end. I want to just remind you, tomorrow we start at 11.30. 11.30 to 12.30, we have Alan Job, CEO of uh, Unilever, the global CEO of Unilever. So we'll have another wonderful session tomorrow. And in the meanwhile, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you for thank that. You. Thank you. And thank you to all the different audiences we've had, including the online audience, the audience of Mohali and you guys. Thank you all very much. See you tomorrow. Thank you.